guys, it's Liana and I'm here today with my dad because we buddy read Gardens of the Moon because I made us buddy read Gardens of the Moon. But I enjoyed it. But he enjoyed it. I think he enjoyed it more than I did, so he's the real winner here. Yeah, so if you've never heard of Gardens of the Moon, um, it's quite a fantasy thing. I feel like everyone else has already read it and already knows about it and I'm late to the game, so just look it up. <laughs> In fairness, it's really difficult to, to say what this book is about, so I'm not sure I could even tell you if I wanted to try. Is that fair to say? That was one of my comments about oh. the book, that it's, it reads a little bit like a uh, yeah, history here. book from, yeah. a, from a personal perspective. A personal perspective? Well, multiple personal perspectives. I know you don't, I, maybe you do, I don't, you don't use Goodreads, right? No. Um, so if you were like using Goodreads and if you were to star rate it like one out of one to five, how, how many stars would you have given it? I'd give it at least four because I really enjoyed how how the characters were really all fleshed out. Their their character arcs were enjoyable to, to follow. Uh, the one thing that I was disappointed in at the end, it seemed like, well, it just stopped and there wasn't an overall story arc that the book brought to an end. Well, in fairness, it didn't really start out by having promising you one. <laughs> so... No. But, but you sort of expect that. Well, you kind of expect for an author to explain things. Oh, it fell over. <laughs> it's having a day. So, like, if you didn't, if I hadn't been like, hey, dad, this is like one of those books that, like, fantasy readers, like, this is like one of those books that you gotta like really pay attention to, that it's really confusing, but like, you know, that's just like one of those books. Like, would you have given it the time of day and the patience to like wade through this? Or would you have like read a chapter at Barnes and Noble and been like, what? I don't know what's happening, goodbye. Well, <laughs> if, if I have seen like one of those re reviews like they do at Romans, you know, where they say this is a good book, you know, they recommend them. You mean like, because the people that work there are like, right, recommend right. This. I mean, I, I probably would have picked it up and read enough of it to, to get a, some feel for it. I mean, that's how I originally picked up the Abercrombie trilogy there. But again, okay, but so like if there wasn't anything telling you that, if it was just like a random book that you picked up and you tried a chapter to see like if you want to read this. I'd be a little dubious. But I, I took your word for it that there were many fans and I decided that I was going to give it a chance in the sense of reading it carefully to pick up the nuance and, and I was rewarded. The author very richly describes both the world and the characters in it, not in an expository sense, but but you're you're a observer there, and you're and you're sharing the perspective of someone, and you learn relatively quickly about that world. Do you think the book would be less good if it was told in a more straightforward manner? <laughs> That's hard to say. I mean, it is that is, I guess, his style. But I mean, like, would you like? I ask because like if uh, if there was a weird choice made, you know, with a book where the narrative structure, with the way to pace it, with telling it non-linearly, like if by the end of the book I'm like, okay, but I see why the author chose to do it this way because ultimately by structuring it this way, it served the purpose of emphasizing this or illustrating this or whatever. At no point, like by the end of the book, I was like, at no point did I go like, oh, okay, but that's why he did it so confusingly. At the end, I was just like, you just did it confusingly. <laughs> for no reason that I can discern. I, I don't know that I would say he did it confusingly. He, he did jump to multiple perspectives and, and you had to learn the sort of the backstory of each, each one of those as you went along. Uh, like I said, the, the, the one frustrating aspect I had was that it didn't have that story arc that you expect from a book that is a, you know, a start to a finish and there are things somewhat wrapped up I mean, you might leave open ends to where there could be continuing things happening to some of the characters, you know, if you, if you want to do a sequel. But uh, this was much more open-ended. It's, it's almost like, okay, we covered European history through the 1700s. Uh, next is going to be the 1800s, and, you know, go ahead and pick up the next history book type of a thing. Well, I'm given to understand that the next book, Dead House Gates, follows completely different characters in a different part of the world, However, we circle back to some of these people in the third book. And then again, we go somewhere else again, I think in the fourth book, and then we circle back to these characters in like the fifth or sixth book. So like, they're, it's not over with them, but we're not going to see their thing in the next book. <laughs> well, if, if you have enough confidence in the author, and at this point I think I do, I haven't been disappointed, uh, 
I'd be willing to follow along and see how it all comes together. Well, like, obviously, <laughs> I agree enough that I'm like, okay, I do. I mean, people love it. I want to see where this goes. So, like, we're reading Dead House Gates in, I want to say May. Is that good for you? If that's what you choose. Uh, I'll probably have read it sooner than that. Oh, you better retain your thoughts for a video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, like, so I just was, like, thinking about this mo most recently. Because, I mean, obviously that frustrated me the not seeing any purpose other than to be like needlessly like, to obfuscate things needlessly like it doesn't serve any purpose beyond just being like well i'm just not gonna tell you i'm just not gonna and you're like okay but is there a reason you're not gonna tell me no nah, i'm just not gonna and um it reminded i was watching some videos they were discussing why tenet fails and like i actually really like the movie tenet i think you liked tenet I did. Um, but like m like the consensus among a lot of viewers and critics, you know, was that like Tenet was confusing or that Tenet didn't make sense or that Tenet blah blah blah. Like people, there, there was like a pretty large consensus that Tenet was weird and confusing. And like I never really thought of comparing them before until I saw a video specifically talking about how the way Tenet opens and how Tenet's opening like kind of fails according to some general principles of storytelling and like the reason it's a poor and a weak opening isn't because it starts in the middle of the action because a lot of movies do that um, and they can still you know sweep you along and you can still get invested in it but in the beginning of Tenet you don't know what anyone is doing or why they're doing it or why it's important or who anyone is and so you don't feel any investment in what's going on and you just feel very alienated by it and so that's your launch point that's when you're the movie is supposed to be grabbing you and pulling you in to be like an now we're on on the road on this story, but Tenet makes you feel so alienated from the story and so confused and so bewildered in the opening of it that you're like, I'm confused and now I'm still and I'm more confused and I continue to be confused. And every scene you're just showing me characters doing stuff, but you've never like I don't know who they are, I don't know where they came from, I don't know why they're here. I know that they're here right now, and I know that they're talking about this right here right now, but I have no context for this. I have no emotional stake in this because I don't know who they are. And that's like one of the main things that people had an issue with with Tenet because they were like, I guess the plot's kind of weird and like messy, but you've done that before with things like Inception. With Tenet, we don't know any of these characters or who they are, or where they came from, so we can't like buy into this. And that's how I felt with Gardens of the Moon. Like, I felt excited that two thirds of the book uh, through the book. I was like recognizing characters when they were in a scene without being named and I was like I know who this character is and I'm like I shouldn't feel excited for it's like the bare minimum of comprehension of a book I'm two-thirds through. Yeah well, <laughs> well to, to be fair about Tenet I, I think it was intended for the big theater and it's intended to grab you with this awe and shock with the opening and then slowly you, you kind of get more into it and on a smaller screen you don't quite get that effect. But, but I want to bring up another film uh, since you brought Tenet up, I think a better one might be Arrival, where you do have the, the time aspect as well, but you have to see it two or three times to really then recognize how how her memory works, where she's remembering the future and, and what the stories for are. Spoilers Arrival, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I guess for Tenet, although I don't think I really spoiled Tenet. I was just like, it's confusing. <laughs> yeah, well, Arrival is out long enough. I don't, I don't think yeah. that would be too much of a spoiler. <laughs> Yeah, but I feel like, again, like if you can tell stories in a way where you've given the audience enough of like a firm foothold, at least in some part of it, to where something else about it can remain confusing. And they're like, okay, I'm with you on this. This remains confusing and this is, remains the mystery and this remains like something that I, I'm assuming and I'm trusting you're going to explain this at some point. But Gardens of the Moon, you don't have a foothold. You're like tossed into the deep end and you've got nothing to hang on to, nothing you recognize, nothing is explained to you. And then you're just like, being punished for not already knowing who everybody is and how right. magic works and you're like what? I, did, I did take a quick look in, in Wikipedia and it said that the author had created or spent time creating the world for some number of years before he decided to create a book that uh, had people in it and, and were doing various things but that the world was more of a Dungeons and Dragons type of a book mm -hmm. oh, I mean the world is and so a lot of the, what the characters do, if you think about it, could be translated to, to characters that you see in that realm. Or that well, genre. sure, but even then, like the rules that you've made up and the limitations and how they're connected to each other, it's still like, it's whatever you made up, but we don't know, sir, what you made up. <laughs> but if, if you enjoy it enough, you're patient to, to see it develop, I guess. But I mean, like Tolkien spent years and years developing his world and only later then decided to tell some stories in it 
and at no point in reading Lord of the Rings are you just like, well, I'm just not going to tell you any of this works. <laughs> You're like, Tolkien explains things as we go. <laughs> You're not just like, confused for not, no reason. Not as much. But yeah, I mean, the author chose to do it that way and and I guess each author is going to be unique that way. But so like, I guess, uh, since the resounding like consensus when like when I said I was gonna read this book, then when I was reading it and vlogging it, and then like when I wrapped up for the month and said I had read it, and then I was quite confused, the like one thousand percent of people who read it liked or hated it, people who reread it multiple times or stopped at the once, every single person said it is normal and it is like the expected outcome that you will be confused the first time that you read it. And like, for me, I'm like, well, then this person has failed in their, like the first part of their mission as a storyteller. And that is to tell a story that your the audience understands. <laughs> if the guaranteed outcome of every single person, it's not just like, oh, it's kind of hard to understand. So a lot of people find it confusing. If it's 100% of people find it confusing, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> Although I was reading it slowly enough to, to where I had absorbed that I really didn't have to go back and reread portions of it. I was able to follow along as I was reading the book. No, I mean, but when I say people rereading, I mean like rereading all the way through to where you've seen where all of this ends up and only then to go back and like now understand what all of this right. was supposed and to like, mean. And there would be a richer rereading and and I, I mean, I, I enjoyed Lord of the Rings far better the second time through as well. But see, again, that's the difference between a movie that re uh, rewards a rewatch versus can only be understood on a rewatch. I, I wouldn't say it was as bad as all that. But like, I mean, like, wait, so at what point did you check Wikipedia? After you had finished it? Uh, yeah. Okay. I was gonna say, like, if you're checking Wikipedia as you go, that's cheating. <laughs> well, you you had told me a couple of things uh, that that it was a very well developed world, and and he doesn't do much explaining, but but it it has a lot a very very large fan base, and people enjoy it. So I took it on faith that it was worthwhile putting the effort into to read it more slowly and to enjoy enjoy the trip, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, well, I did go into it myself that way. I felt like I went into it knowing that I should expect to feel confused, but I was hoping to find that I could suss out some, like, some reasoning for it. That I could, like, once having read it, I could be, like, putting myself in the author's shoes, be like, I, I mean, I see why he told it this way. Like, I get, like, how that alters the experience that is a net positive and that it some way colors the world or colors like the point he's making about how we understand world or something. Cause so like, and I kind of plan to do a video on this. So like, <laughs> stay tuned. But I plan to talk about more in depth about comparing how Malazan, how Steven Erickson like confuses the reader or bewilders the reader versus how N.K. Jemisin does it in The Broken Earth. In The Broken Earth, it feels extremely intentional. It feels like I know, while I, like having read those books, like I see why this was done. It wasn't like just done. It wasn't just like, well, it just, it just is a confusing book. And that's just the author decided to do it that way. And I feel like I know why the author decided to do it that way. And I see how that is a feature of the story and how it helps like it, with the experience that the reader is meant to have it has an effect on it. It's not just like, well, I'm just not gonna tell you, <laughs> which is how I felt about Gardens of the Moon. I was like, if there's a reason for this, I can a thousand percent get behind that and be like, you have to be confused at first for then the way that it, you know, comes out in the end, you're like, ah, I see, I, I did need for it, I needed to be confused in the beginning for it to work this way and I get why it did it, but at no point did I feel that way. <laughs> but I would say it's more like visiting a foreign country and you know that it's gonna be a struggle to really, really know what's going on around you and and the, the traditions and the way people do things. But uh, you know that given some time, you'll absorb it by osmosis. But I guess that I regard the author as my Sherpa in that foreign land, like land, and they are a bad Sherpa if I'm that lost. Like, what am I paying you for, Sherpa? <laughs> You're supposed to be guiding me through this world. But really, were you, were you that lost? I'm saying I was more lost than I should be. <laughs> Like, I shouldn't have to work that hard to understand your story if you're telling it well. No. It's not my job. It's your job to explain it. I thought that it, the book would be at least four stars, perhaps more than that. Uh, am I getting a feeling that you're close to that or you're a little less than that? I gave it three. Ooh. <laughs> According to Goodreads, three means you liked it. Okay. Four means you loved it, and five means that it was, like, perfect. Well, and... and on that scale, like Lord of the Rings would be five stars. For you. For me, okay. 
I think I, I'm trying, I'm pretty sure I gave Fellowship four stars. I usually only give books five stars if I'm like, I would never change anything about this. <laughs> uh, well, what would you change about a Michelangelo? You, you regard it as a work of art and uh, anything you change would probably be to the detriment of the artist's intent. So if, if it was more expository or filled you in more about the world, I'm... Are we talking about Lord of the Rings now or about Gardens of the Moon? No, I'm talking Gardens of the Moon. Uh, it, it would be a different style. And I did grow to like like uh, some of how how he was uh, leading us along, showing us where things happened. But he wasn't leading us. Well, <laughs> that was the problem. <laughs> he, well, he was telling. We were going through events as they happened, and I mean, there were surprises in terms of the power struggles that, between characters that evolved in the book. But that's the kind of surprises you want to get. I mean, so again, for to me, like it felt a little bit almost like. The author didn't trust us to be interested just in the story as it is, so we had to contrive to make it more confusing so that we're so busy chasing our tails just trying to figure out what is the story that we don't have time to think about whether or not that story is actually interesting or not. And I do think the story is interesting, which is why I'm like, just trust that your story is a good one, that these characters are interesting because they are, and this world is cool. You don't have to like add this gimmick of making us confused AF so that we're so busy being like, but what is happening? And then so proud of ourselves for figuring out what's happening that you're like, oh, wow, I'm, w w did I like it though? I didn't even have time to think about that. <laughs> well, I, I found that he didn't throw in any unneeded MacGuffins. There were, there were a lot of MacGuffins. <laughs> there were a lot of MacGuffins. But uh, you get the sense that, uh, that, Okay, at some point you will get the follow-on of, of whatever was meant by that or was happening with that. And now at the at the end of the book, I realize that uh, it may not be in the next book or even in the one after that. But I'm sure that in whatever <laughs> is, is, ten, is ten books that uh, that will yeah. pretty much have, have closed closed many of the of the uh, interesting lines that he he's opened up here. So like one of the things that actually I found the most interesting from more from like a narrative perspective and less as like my reading experience being like, ooh, but more just like the back of my mind being like, I kind of like the this recurring theme. And then I found out from someone who's read the whole series that this never comes into it again. And I was like, well, just kidding. I guess I'm not interested in this anymore. But that was the, the God of Chance and the spinning coin and that motif recurring almost like in a poetic like refrain throughout like oh. multiple scenes. And I was like, that's so interesting to me as this through line through this whole book where we keep seeing this motif recur. And it kind of, if there's anything unifying this this crazy, unexplained nonsense, it's that. And then I found out that got a chance, and the coin just, like, stops being a thing after the first book, and we're just, like, never addressing well, it Well, he was just <laughs> one was of like, the oh, gods. Okay. Yeah. I, I never thought that he would be, like, a prime mover. I don't even need it to be a prime mover, but, I mean, like, I thought that we were doing something with this. That, like, we were really developing, like, the significance of this motif, and that perhaps this is kind of almost the thesis of what's going on here is, like, maybe a chance element and how this is like the coin is emblematic of the role that chance plays in everything and that things are not planned and that things are always chance or like something like that. And I was like, I'm liking that. <laughs> and I was like, is this going to be kind of the thesis maybe of the entire series? Because we're just kind of getting it teased here and there as like dropping it in here and dropping it in there. And I'm like, I'm noticing it and I'm wanting it to be something. And it turns out like, ah, nah, it's so not gonna be something like the, the fickleness of, of gods, but in this case, uh, represented by the spinning coin, but other gods would have different ways of showing how fickle they are with respect to their, their worshippers or humanity? I mean, it doesn't have to be specific to the gods. It can just be that, like, they're representative of the element of chance in life or in the universe or something like that. Again, like, I didn't have an answer for what where the, he was going with this, but it seemed that he was going somewhere with this, that it was a recurring motif that I should take note of. And then it <laughs> turns out... Well, I can try to derive meaning from it in Gardens of the Moon, but it's never going to be a thing again. <laughs> that was just that particular God's thing. So I feel kind of let down by that. Because <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, then I, well, let's, all these things that will be revealed, all right, I'll go with you. <laughs> the well, one that I was yeah. interested in was apparently that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I didn't quite take that as a promise. I just thought, well, that was an interesting aspect of it. And, and the fear everybody had about this particular God and, and the involvement of him, meaning that, that things could turn on a dime, as, as we saw, mm -hmm. uh, that was just that particular gun. I guess I was, I was like, all right, I have to search, since the author's not going to hold my hand, I have to find 
the meaning. I have to find the thesis. I have to find what's going on. And well, no, no, but no, don't pick the wrong thing because that's not going to be a thing. <laughs> no, we're down to Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, right? Uh, I guess. Because uh, a lot of things are searches for meaning and, and many people find their own meaning, but I mean, that's a philosophy of always being explored. So since you said that you really liked the characters and the character arcs and felt that they were fleshed out and like fully realized, was there any standouts, like particular characters that you like latched onto or like you were really hoping that you're gonna see them again? There were several of them. I mean, I, Paran, for one, I mean, obviously he he's, plays a large role. That uh, the, the female uh, mage, uh, uh, right? No, what was her? Uh, Tattersail? Tattersail, yeah. I mean, she she was interesting, and obviously, well, it seemed to me obviously it'll, it'll come into play, since there was some prophecies or whatever. I guess that's a <laughs> spoiler alert, so to speak. What uh, fantasy does not have a prophecy? <laughs> right, right. Uh, so there there were interesting interesting characters, and and that's not the the, the sum of them. Uh, the bridge the bridge crew, obviously. Whiskey Jack. Whiskey Jack. Be right. named after Jack Daniels, you think? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm consciously on the part of the author who knows. Um, he was like taking Hemingway's advice, writing drunk, editing sober, and was like, I'll just name him Whiskey Jack. <laughs> I mean, the whole opening, uh, the, the the characters and the, and the young lad in the opening was like, well, obviously they're being introduced and, and I'm sure they're going to play play a larger role as we go along, so let's just pay attention to them. Yeah, but again, it's kind of hard to know which things to pay attention to. It's kind of it sort of like reminds me of um, like a study tactic that is taught in school but that cannot be applied here um, because of how confusingly it's told is that like the teachers would often say that when you're taking a test like the kind of test that has like a, a passage that you're meant to read and then multiple choice questions about the passage every teacher for every test prep was like read the questions first then read the passage because then you can zero in on the things that you need to be looking for to answer those questions. And like that's kind of like when you're reading a book, you're kind of like you don't you can't read the questions first because there are no questions. But that's what kind of what you're mentally doing. You're kind of figuring out like which are the things that are gonna be things that I need to be paying attention to that aren't just like a random you know like okay you told me there's a window in this room, but I probably don't need to super retain that there was a window in this room. So like, but what are the things that I need to be retaining? And like this book is just so all over the place. That you're like I can't possibly retain everything. <laughs> so like ah. So on a second read, now that you've seen all of it, you're like, well, now I finally know. Now I've read the questions. Now I finally know what I'm supposed to be paying attention to. Well, I, I did find that I had retained enough of the things I needed to retain to, to where it wasn't a surprise that that was important. So, But I guess, I mean, that, that goes back to where I had faith that the author wasn't going to be throwing in a lot of unnecessary stuff. That if he says something, think about it. Oh, that's part of that character. There's something going on with that. Let's see what that means later on type of thing. That's also because you knew this is the type of book it would be. I was warned. If you had casually picked it up and you're like five chapters deep and you're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> what was any of that? <laughs> Very good point. And, and like I said, I, I, I took you at, at, uh, at your word where you said that people really enjoy it. So if they do, that means that, that those kinds of things, you aren't, you aren't going to be led down this merry path and then disappointed kind of a thing. I guess. But I just feel like a book that has to be like, you need a disclaimer first before you read it. I'm like, well, then that's a flaw. <laughs> well, it also leads to uh, a, a slow development of a fan base. It doesn't really quite catch you and that quickly. Cultish fan base. Well, then that's some part of me, like the cynical part of me, is like, are people fans of this just because they're just like so GD proud that they figured it out and they're just like, oh, the first time you read it, you're confused. You're not like us. Who like no because we read it like ten times and we actually know it now and we're like you have to be like in the club because the first time you read it you don't know anything. <laughs> I, I know you've got some mixed thoughts about the Stormlight Archive. By mixed you mean I hate it? Then yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought there were aspects you liked about it, but but whatever. I liked the interlude where that guy is in some place where they walk around in like an inch of water. <laughs> and I was that like, was this interesting is interesting <laughs> and it's never revisited again and has nothing to do with what's going on in Way of Kings. Well, uh, all contrary, it actually does get revisited. Not in Way of Kings. I guess I do. I've read further than you, obviously. Yeah, but why bring it up in Way of Kings if it has nothing to do with Way of Kings? <laughs> it, was, it was just something that it, you have to have some faith in the author. I don't have as much faith in Sanderson, the author, that that a lot of those things will have as much meaning as when when I read, if I read subsequent books, 
as I do in, in this particular. Uh, I'm curious. So I, I mean, I obviously, well, I also just liked this book better than I liked Way of Kings. But like, since you also, you liked Way of Kings, unlike me, so why is it that you have greater faith in Erickson on one book than Sanderson after having read like five or six of his books? Wow, that's uh, that's interesting. I mean, it's like like the, having seen the series Lost and, and knowing that you were being led down this merry path and everything was going to be left unknowable versus uh, the high quality writing in a series like Dark. But I mean, I would almost argue like, I mean, based on what I heard, that is that Malazan, you know, is expansive, is bewildering and confusing all over the place, but you know, a lot of things do circle back and get answered. But in your own experience, and in my own experience, Brandon Sanderson in the Mistborn trilogy, he answered everything he set up. So like, why wouldn't you have faith in Brandon Sanderson? Why would you have more faith in Steven Erickson? I feel like I'm playing devil's advocate because yeah. I'm like the Brandon Sanderson hater. <laughs> and, and maybe I, I, I will develop more faith in, in uh, that particular series of books. Uh, I, I, I don't know why, it's, it's just a feeling and, and feelings are based on something intuitive that you've sensed there. Is so it because I, I, of things like the interludes that have nothing to do with the book? <laughs> and you're like, well, I don't know why that was there, so I'm losing faith. <laughs> in some ways, I get the feeling that there were things developed in those books, and I'm not sure how much the author really wants to develop that more later, so is it really worthwhile paying that much attention? That's kind of the impression I'm getting. But I, I don't know if, if that's going to be true It'll or not. It'll just be another spinning coin situation where it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> right, right. I mean, uh, unlike you, I, I probably will at some point read more of the of, of that series, the Stormlight Archive there. But uh, let, let's see how, how much I'm led down the path. Cause, uh, it's going to be ten books just like Malazan. The parallels. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's uh, you know... Winter is coming. I mean, uh, George R.R. R. Martin, uh, I don't know if it's the combination of the TV show doing other storylines and creating other kinds of things. And to me, the, the, the whole TV series ended up not, not in any kind of a satisfying way based on the, the opening of it, the, those ice, ice walkers. The White Walkers. White Walkers, excuse me. Uh, how, the, how they came out, and, and that, that should have been the ultimate kind of the, the, the bogeyman, but, but yet it was other histories and other things well, mixed in. We can't blame George R. R. Martin for that necessarily, because that's not part of, that's not canon. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it got mixed in with what the TV needed, and, and so, so I, I, I definitely don't have faith that things will be wrapped up nicely uh, if and when he does finish. Because of how the TV series went, you think the books won't be? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, if, the, if he doesn't incorporate so many of the elements of, of, uh, of what the TV series brought up in the books, there would be a lot of disappointment. And, and uh, the, the, the TV series just opened up too many other possibilities, I think. so. It's There's a lot of things that are in the books. I swear this video is still about Malazan. We'll get back to that. But, um, <laughs> uh, like, there was a lot of plot lines that the TV show, TV show closed, which is why, like, they literally couldn't have the ending that George R. R. Martin had potentially planned and written because there's plot lines that they didn't ever have. Like, Lady Stoneheart, where's she at? <laughs> like, we don't know yeah. how that plays into it at all. There's, like, multiple characters that got condensed into one character. Like, so there's multiple things like that where, like, that might be a big part of how this is actually meant to be resolved. And since that wasn't in the show ever... They couldn't do that, but the books would have those things, obviously. Yeah, and, and maybe it's it's almost like Star Wars, where the, it is such a shit show that that the, it takes the fan base or a, or a very good director to to bring some honesty back to the to the universe. Well, yeah, and that's another thing that I've seen like a lot of people make, which is a, an excellent point, is that like through the course of the show, just because of how the 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 nuance that the actors brought to the characters. By the end of the series, the characters were different from how they are in the book, and not because it wasn't being true to the books, just because like they had developed personalities that were kind of unique to the show. Like even like Tyrion became a much more sympathetic character because like Peter Dinklage's performance is much more sympathetic than how Tyrion is in the books. Tyrion's kind of a little monster, and so like you know, like the endings that are written for these characters in the books might very well fit the characters in the books, but these really aren't those characters anymore. So, like, forcing them into these endings that the show was like, well, that's the end point, so we just got to move them there. <laughs> You're like, but that's, they're not those people anymore. So, like, the story George R. R. Martin is telling in his books is necessarily different. 
because his characters are different from how the show Right, was. the added dimension the actors brought, right. Or you know, not even, like, it makes it sound like they don't have dimension in the books, but they're just, they're just different. Like, like even the ages, like, Jon Snow's, like, 14 years old. <laughs> Kit Harington yeah. is very much not 14 years old, even though he acts like a little bitch. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, but yeah, so Malazan. <laughs> Malazan, You right. have apparently great faith in Steven Erickson, like, nailing the landing. I, I guess it's because I know that he did spend all that time developing the world. And now now that he has had various characters and he has a history in mind for the world, those, those characters are, are going to be players in, in that history. So I, I do have faith that he really has worked it out. And, and like to go back to the Stormlight Archive, I'm not sure that Sanderson has, has fleshed out his world as well as Malazan is. You mean because like... It's not, to your knowledge, being independently crafted without a story in mind, like, unto itself. Yeah, that's part of it, yeah. Do you think, then, it's necessary for a fantasy author to have done that, to have a successful fantasy story? Not necessarily, but if it is really complex, maybe it is necessary. I know some authors like to create a, the story arc for multiple books, and, and then it's a matter of filling in the details. Others... It's organic, they, they have the characters do things, and they're even surprised by how the characters develop and what they do. I mean, there Plotters. are different approaches. Plotters versus pantsers. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, because then the ones that like plan out where this is going to go, then they end up with that problem that we just had with what we said with Game of Thrones, where like, if you plan where this character's going to end up, you end up having the character may not behave in an organic way, because suddenly they have to make decisions that make them go here. They veer off course. Because you know where this is supposed to end up, so you have to force them to end up there. And if it's artificial, it feels artificial in terms of where they choose to go, then, then it's unsatisfying too. So how, how well crafted and, and how devious and intuitive is the author in terms of being able to bring it all together? Well, I feel like Steven Erickson's pretty devious in the whole not telling us anything. <laughs> no, I'm not going to argue that. I just feel like it's rude. <laughs> Honestly, like that's I think what bothers me most. I'm just like... It's rude. <laughs> Your expectations are what they are. I did, I mean, yeah. I did like the characters. I did like the world building. I, again, like, that's why I was mad at it, mostly. Because I was like, this is really good. Why are you making it so hard for me to, like, get to a point where I know what's going on? Like, why did it have to be so hard? Like, this, what's going on is interesting by itself. And if you had just explained it from the beginning... Without me being like, huh? <laughs> like, I could have just been enjoying this story from page one. Instead of taking two-thirds of the book to finally be like, okay, I finally am with you. <laughs> well, I, like I said before, I don't think it was as bad as all that. And I know your, your schedule of reading books forces you to be a little more aggressive about pushing through a book. So I might have taken a little more time going through this one than you did. Yeah, maybe. I again, like I just feel like there's a difference between something being difficult to understand and being impossible to understand. And, I, and that's not again like as you went along, you picked it up. But I mean, like from the get go, like it's something you're gonna have to figure out. And like at some point, you start to be able to. But it's not like from the beginning of the book, like if you really pay attention, it's just complex. But it's very much there. It's very much not there. It's well, just I later you you're gonna. It's, I, I think that there there are things laid out there that that do sort of make sense. I mean, uh, you, you do get the sense that uh, you're dealing with very powerful beings at the, from the onset, and, and, and it isn't that far along to where you discover that some of them actually are gods. But I mean, that's like one of the biggest frustrations that I have then is because like what makes you invested in a story, what makes you able to like put yourself in this story, understand the stakes of the story, is having a point of reference for the stakes, having a point of reference for power levels. And so, like, if you tell me that this being has such and such power that you have not explained, and I have no point of reference for what other powers there are, like, I don't, I don't know, relative to this world, how bad is this? How good is this? How much is this? Like, when you tell me, you know, like, I have, like, 10,000 shroot bucks, I'm like, well, what is the rate of exchange? Like, are you a millionaire or is a shroot buck worth nothing? So, like, when you tell me well, this random Well, you want to know how much word, is a pack of gum. Yeah, so like when you say random words and random power levels with no point of reference in this world, then I don't, I don't know how to react to that. Like, I'm like, okay, so you have this thing and you are this thing. I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't know. Does that mean you like basically rule the universe because you're mega superpower? Or is that just kind of like 
average for like well the thing you are like I, what is a warren why do y'all have warrens i what is happening with that you have many warrens is that a lot is that unusual <laughs> and even in the pantheon of gods uh, i mean there were at least a half a dozen i don't i didn't specifically count them but at least if not more especially if you consider that there were supposed to be the eldest gods again it's relative now is there one super god above them all i don't know it's not clear yet I mean, the relativity of things like is something that is only way later in the book that you can kind of begin to suss it out because you've seen enough examples of what things people are getting up to that you're like, I guess that seems worse than this other thing. <laughs> That's what I was like, if you're talking like, if your fantasy world is a very sort of realistic fantasy world and like it's all mainly swords, daggers, shields, cannons, trebuchets, like, and then once in a while we have some magic show up. I know what a sword can do. I know what a trebuchet can do. So when you're telling me that you're laying siege, like I have a, a very good point of reference for the level of damage we're talking about, the level of power. If you tell me that you have an army of 100,000 human soldiers, like I know uh, what that can do. But when you have magical words that are whatever you mean them to mean, and this is my only explanation for how much is going on, and I'm like, but what, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. Yeah, I mean... If you're going to talk about modern war, if you, you talk about a, a nuclear weapon of 20 kilotons, that's one thing, that's that's a Hiroshima type of a, of a weapon, versus what destroyed the Bikini Atoll, which is the multi-megaton, uh, which has obviously See, never been used. you sound like Steven Erickson, because like for most of that, I was like, I don't know what any of that is. I don't know what Hiroshima is. <laughs> okay. There's, there's Peaks, an aerospace engineer who has some background there. Yeah, one that assumes his audience either needs to already be on the same page with him or you'll pick it up as I go. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Just rude! <laughs> Maybe that's why I react to Steven Erickson like this, because they reminded me of you, never explaining shit. <laughs> well, you're a smart person, you'll pick it up. Ugh! Why'd you have to make it so hard? All I needed was help on my long division. And now I know about imaginary numbers. <laughs> that's right, I do remember that. <laughs> You're Steven Erickson, that's why you have faith in him. Never answer questions directly. Now, I, yes, this is making so much sense. Yes, this is how you approach life. <laughs> Ask you a simple question, you're like, what if I just don't answer that? Or I tell oh. you a different answer that you didn't ask for. Cheerio. Yeah, that's, that is how I've always learned things where, where I will inundate myself with, with uh, lots of facts and things that have happened until I see a pattern emerge. I mean, that is my way of learning things. Yeah, but the thing is, if your professor is teaching his class that way, he's a bad professor. <laughs> no, I'll have faith that he's telling me all these things because they are important to learn, and at some point they will fall together and make sense. But what if he's a bad professor? And you shouldn't if he's have a bad professor, faith? then my faith in the university is shut. Okay, but that's like, you've already invested so much of your brain space learning all this stuff, like, well, it's gonna pay off. And then you find out, you're like, oh, just kidding. Like, one of these things is relevant to my degree, and all the rest of that was just, just nonsense. Great. <laughs> yeah, well, it sucks to be you, then. <laughs> well, it's a bad professor. <laughs> you shouldn't have to take it on faith. But you do. There's so many things. I mean, we have faith in our parents that they're looking out for our best interests, and and some of the most screwed up kids are the ones that find out that their parents didn't have their best interest at heart. Oh boy. Steven Erickson is a bad parent. <laughs> no, no, no I, I, I don't think so. Oh, okay. Just a bad parent to his reader children. <laughs> if, if you are worried about that, I guess that's a concern. Just left his kids so confused. <laughs> What's going on? Why won't you just tell me? Well, magic and imaginary numbers. There you go. Yep. Now, completely switching gears, I like the name a lot, but the character left me uh, underwhelmed, but I'm told that it's a fan favorite, Anamander Rake. Ah, uh, the Lord of the Moon. Like that name, as soon as I heard it, it sounds like a name from Dune. And like, I just like, that's a cool name. But then every time he popped up, I was like, you're super boring though. Like your name is super cool, and that's the coolest part of you. Hi. Well, he's, he is very dark. <laughs> he is non-human. So uh, developing him is, is going to be developing a, a person that doesn't have human characteristics, so it's, it'll be interesting. I agree. Who are you agreeing with? The others, not me? <laughs> well, I, I agree that that is an interesting character, and, and okay, you said that you didn't quite like him at the get-go. And, and well, I mean, liking makes it sound like I, I, I don't have to like a character. I just was like, I feel like 
well, the way it was written, I just kept feeling like, I feel like you think he's enigmatic and cool, but I don't feel like he's enigmatic, enigmatic I, and cool. All I get is the sense that he is a player. Well, that could be said for all of them. Well, there there's players and there's bit roles and there's players who really do things and change things. And he's obviously okay. a big He's player. a player that gets like a character poster by himself for the movie. Oh, okay. assuredly. Okay. And then there's good old Kreppa, whose name you can't possibly forget because he says it himself in the third person. a lot. <laughs> and he turned out to be more than, than I thought he initially would be. But that's another choice where I'm like, but why does Kreppa refer to Kreppa as Kreppa? Why was this choice made, author? <laughs> why? <laughs> Maybe we'll find more about that character, about why, why he is doing I that. I hope so, because it's weird. Super weird and off-putting. Yeah, no, I, I didn't... I, I thought that was clownish initially, and then the character actually, in terms of motives and things that he was doing, obviously was very serious, and some of his buffoonishness was to, uh, to dispel attention that he's a serious player. Well, it's a lot of Logan Nine Fingers. It's always wise to appear like, or appear, or to, to seem less than you are. Right. And the ones that it's so important for them to be really big, well, yep, they're a big target, all right. I think that's, I know you didn't finish it, but that's a thing that Locke Lamora always says that, like, with the luxury of being constantly underestimated. Yeah. I have to say, so, like, I feel like, again, like, I did like the plot and the characters in the world, and I'm mainly frustrated with how, like, needlessly obfuscated everything was. But I even so the execution I think was uh, like made up for the cliche of it. But I did find it to be very cliche that all of this kind of converges on some fancy party where all of the parties are now going to converge. And like it, it reminded me of there's so many plots in a freaking CW show where everything just it's like oh this like contrived event where we have the event where conveniently people are going to have masks. And now where everybody is going to converge and it just it feels so contrived to me to have this be the like end meetup goal and i'm like for the originality of everything else that's going on i'm like really it's all going to converge at like the party scene like really <laughs> well I, I i take the perspective that the god of chance was actually putting out a lot of threads that he was kind of he she whatever the twin gods of chance uh, were forcing to to really come together at that point since much of much of the plot does revolve around what this god of chance has kind of uh, set out there. Okay, but again, it's Steven Erickson the wrote this, so like he decided to make it all converge at a party scene. Right, and, and I could argue that uh, the god of chance played a, a role in that th things that seemingly were really random, but, uh, really looked obviously turned out not to be random, and it was less and less random as it went along, and and like you said, it converged in that party scene. Yeah, but that's the thing that I find cliche. I'm like, it was there was interesting things about interesting things about how it was executed and things that went down in that party. But just the fact of this is where things come down to feels like the most trite thing that I've ever seen. Because like like the amount of like Ocean's Eleven type movies where like, well, we all have to get this thing done before the grand ball, where every, that's where she's gonna be. It's our one chance to get her. Like this is the plot of like so many bad movies, so many fantasies, so many like stories have that be the thing that this all like the cli like the climactic like moment well and and i said earlier that the story arc didn't feel like it was finished uh perhaps in erickson's mind having that big party and the culmination of a lot of those threads coming together maybe he thought that would be enough to to be the finish of a story arc for this one particular book to me it, it didn't quite feel like it but uh i guess that's just one way of approaching it Certainly is, and we saw that was his way. So yeah, it has yeah. to be by definition a way his to approach way. it. His way, exactly. <laughs> yeah, hopefully there's no climactic party scene in Dead House Gates. <laughs> It'll be something else. Because if there sure is, I will judge it. <laughs> right, and and then you would have real difficulty in going on to a, possibly a third book or whatever. Oh, I just felt like the thing that it most reminded me of having it converge at this party scene is like every season. Of, of the Vampire Diaries on the CW because this small town in where they live that has this historical society this town like because it's a long season so there's always like a two arc season and every arc there was like a founders ball or like the town council's party or like the historical parade where we celebrate this event 
some big gala thing where this is where everybody's gonna be at when this well, art social concludes. calendar that everybody partakes of uh, means something but yeah it's just it's just it was always that where we're all gonna be in our get-ups we're all gonna have our masks and everyone's gonna be in the same fancy place and like this is that episode so when we got to the party episode of gardens with the moon i was like is this vampire diaries and i'm a, a big fan <laughs> of the vampire diaries so i can't quit connect there but, but well, that's what i'm saying like it feels like for as original and bold and innovative and complex and intricate this whole thing was and then i was like we have like the party scene <laughs> like really <laughs> well i didn't quite take it as much of a trope as, as you are obviously i mean there was a convergence that that was used there were a lot of plot lines obviously coming together but i didn't think it was the overused cliche I guess I was disappointed in it because this whole book seems to be so like, well, I'm just too complicated to be understood and I won't bother explaining myself to you because this is unlike anything you've ever seen before and you just have to trust me. And then we have a Vampire Diary style climactic party scene. And I was like, so we couldn't be a little more original about that part? <laughs> well, you're saying that you felt a certain level of condescension on the part of the author. Yeah, I'm <laughs> very annoyed by that. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't feel that. <laughs> but so, uh, it is what it, at least he's to a degree able to walk the walk that he so boldly talks. <laughs> and kudos to him for that. <laughs> I mean, like, if not for that, I'd be like, oh, screw you. But I was like, I mean, you can write well, sir. I just kind of wish you wouldn't be so, like, I'm not going to explain it to the plebs. <laughs> like, why not? <laughs> You'll catch on. But yeah, if you couldn't also write well, then I'd be like, okay, you just get on. <laughs> yeah, well, there are many authors where, where I read a little bit of stuff and it's like, this this seems so warmed over in terms of what the people are and what the goings on, that it doesn't seem worthwhile to explore where this particular author is going to take it, because uh, is it really going to add to my enjoyment another rehashing of this, this kind of a story? Probably not you feel like you've seen this all before and done better yeah exactly <laughs> exactly whereas there, there there was certainly a freshness to erickson's world yep. i've rarely read things that are that confusing <laughs> <laughs> and i mean i did uh on a more positive i feel like i've mainly just been very harsh <laughs> and been like it was fine but <laughs> i will say i did very much like the style of the prose being kind of more this like Kind of more archaic and formal style because it i i it's not that i think that there's objectively anything wrong with a simpler more modern style but my personal preference leans towards fantasy having more of that formal style of writing because the like my immersion as a reader like is uh like i'm able to immerse myself more and take m many more like leaps uh for a fantasy world if this is kind of the nature of the storytelling because it's more in keeping with the it just makes it all feel kind of old and magical and unknowable because you're talking about it, you know, in this way. That's kind of, you know, sounds like some ancient unknowable prophecy. But if you're just talking in a very cut and dry and modern, slangy, short speech, and but you're also talking about epic prophecies and magic, then it sounds stupid to me. So, like, I, my personal preference uh, is for the type of prose that he uses in this book, where it is kind of flowery and old-timey sounding. Yeah, not the slangy... Uh... Yeah, like smart alecky, like you were saying. We're not even smart. I mean, like to to shit on Sanderson again, because like may as well. We've already started. What's it gonna <laughs> hurt? Like that's one of the main things. I shouldn't say one of the main things. It is among <laughs> the variety of things that irk me when I read Sanderson, because like that very unadorned, straightforward, like very basic prose. I'm like, it's not incorrect. It's not. There's nothing like objectively wrong about doing it that way. But it's much more difficult for me to take seriously this majestic fantasy world if you're describing it in a very like mechanical and rote and unpoetic way. Well, yeah, that I didn't ever said it, but Erickson is very poetic in many of the descriptions. Right, so that's what I'm saying. Like I, for all of the like me sitting there being like, can you just fucking explain this? Like there was also in the middle of being confused about what is generally going on, just the individual phrases, individual sentences, individual things moments of dialogue or a character philosophizing about something or again that's why I found the like spinning coin motif to be so fascinating because it did it the whole book had this kind of like poetic and feeling where you can feel like the book itself has this like 
the way that a poem will keep having a rhyming motif and a refrain because that's part of the poetic structure of it whereas like a regular old book wouldn't have that so like that made me take it more seriously <laughs> well sense? yeah and that's the confidence that the author does know how to weave all of his threads but it's not i mean weaving of the threads it's just being able to write well well yeah being able to write well is certainly what you hope of your authors <laughs> but again it's not incorrect to write in a way that's not flowery like sanderson like grammatically it's correct like that is a purely taste preference thing because a lot of people don't like flowery writing and that's why they like sanderson is because his prose is very just straightforward it's an unadorned you like you explained the thing in exactly the number of words you needed to explain it and i know what this looks like now as opposed to being more fanciful about how you go about telling it and i like the more fanciful bordering on shakespeare kind of thing yeah well that's part of why I really enjoyed a, a version of the audiobook of The Lord of the Rings, too. I loved the, the narrator and how it brought so much of the, of the speech to life in ways that I hadn't seen as I was reading it. But then that's credit to the narrator, not to the Tolkien's word choice. True, but perhaps if I was to spend more time thinking about that, I could come up with that. And, and I have done poetic readings to where I've, where I've done that. But yeah, that's an interpretation of it, where it's like the prose by itself is either adorned and poetical or it's straightforward. No matter how beautifully you read it, Sanderson's prose is very straightforward, and Erickson's prose, you could read it flatly, but it's still very adorned and right, right. poetical. And it, it, it deserves the attention and a, and a treatment that it is poetry, even in, in prose. But then, like, on the flip side of that, even though that's the thing about it that I probably enjoyed the most, like, part of me is also, I'm like, but that is what also makes it, like, slightly more difficult to understand. Because you already didn't explain anything, and then you wrote it in this flowery way <laughs> to where, like, a person could be totally lost in the purple miasma of these prose. <laughs> like, like, what's going on? where you have to on? learn how, how to read Shakespeare. After, after a while, you get used to how, how he approaches things and what his language is like. Mm -hmm. But at first, it's, it's like, it is confusing. But, yeah, but to me, like, I love seeing an author, like, it, on... Like, aside from whether or not I like what they're doing with the story or characters, I like them demonstrating a command of the language in a way to where they are, like, just being a wordsmith. Where, like, there's a difference between just telling a story, you know, like, appropriately, correctly, you know, clearly, versus, like, playing with the language. With, like, multifaceted meanings, double meanings, like, un, you know, double entendres, like, that kind of thing where I'm like, regardless of the story you're telling, I just like to see you play with words. And Steven Erickson... For all my irritation with how confusingly he told it, I did like watching him play with words. Very much so, yeah. yeah. So I can praise it for that. Good, Without good. qualification, I suppose. So, so let's see how much we enjoy that second book. <laughs> Dead House Games, yeah. Well, it's whole new characters we got to learn about. So we thought okay. we had some training wheels on now, but nope, just toss them out. We're doing something else now. Put on right, your water rings. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Look forward to it. <laughs> so any other thoughts about Gardens of the Moon? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, I, other than that, I did enjoy it, and, and I do intend to read more, more of, of, of what he's written there. Well, yeah, he's got you the book, so you better. Yeah, I, I, I better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I guess that check in again later in a month or so. <laughs> We're going to talk we'll about Dead House Gates. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a, a pleasure. <laughs> Let us know in the comments down below if you agree or disagree. Uh, I'm guessing agree and disagree <laughs> based on the fans of these books. But whatever you want to let me know slash us know. I don't know if you're going to look at the comments or if you're going to rely on me to tell you what they say. I'll uh, put an eyeball there. Okay, so he's watching. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Love it all the things. I post videos on Saturdays. Other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. And sometimes other random people. <laughs> so like and subscribe. And I, slash sometimes we, will see you when we see you. Right, you're out of frame. Well, I have a short torso. We have to compromise. <laughs> I need to slouch a little bit. Well, whatever. You don't have to exaggerate. But well, you were sitting so straight that you're well, I was, out of frame. I didn't want to be creepy by having my hand up here. I thought, well, Those whatever. are the only options? It's to sit up like this or to be like, Ugh. Not quite, but I was just trying to find my, <laughs> find my spot here. Okay.